Thank you very much, Leo. And thanks so much um, to you and to Izzy and to Sarah for organizing this and for giving me a reason to think about Hopper. Uh, I haven't addressed him in my uh, published work yet. And so you can tell me if what I'm presenting today you think is worth pursuing or if I should scrap it. OK. The illustrations Hopper made for journals like Hotel Management and System, the magazine of business, and the ads he made for manufacturers of clothing and other sorts of products early in his career are not where we'll find the true Edward Hopper, or so it may seem. Following Hopper's lead, scholars often present this art for hire as unsatisfying and restrictive work that necessarily constrained the artist's vision tethering it to profit motives and ready-made storylines, such as what makes men buy, as this system article put it. If, quote, nothing was too daring for modern selling, if it's steam whistles for attention and paragraphs with dynamite, as the caption for Hopper's drawing at here bottom left put it, this would seem to be the opposite of what the artist would strive for in his later paintings, including those devoted to hotels. In a 2015 article, Erica Doss made an important case for how, quote, modernism's aversion to emotional intensity, end quote, registers not only in Hopper's paintings, but in his illustrative work as well. And I think the way Hopper pictures modern selling steam whistling and dynamiting here with a figure who appears to be more or less unmoved by it on his commute could be used to support that point. It seems clear that the lessons learned during a 25-year period drawing story illustrations for trade journals and designing covers, ads, and various forms of sales ephemera must reverberate in the paintings in some way. Today, I want to look at an early, unpublished magazine cover design that has attracted almost no notice in Hopper scholarship as a way into the potential resonances between the paintings and this sort of paper work. This is, I suppose, a juvenile production, and it would surely be classed by some as unsuccessful since it was never published. But perhaps Hopper never submitted it for serious consideration. Perhaps this is Hopper working out and or assessing the value of this sort of paper production as he plays on and maybe even spoofs the visual rhetoric of the American profit motive. Whether or not this design contains some seed of critique I believe it points to Hopper's intimate understanding of American commercial culture and marks something like the start of what will be a lifelong negotiation of his art's place within it. The artist painted this watercolor on paper sometime between 1906 and 1908, according to Hopper scholar Gail Levin and the Whitney Museum of American Art, where it now lives. Profitable advertising was founded in Boston in 1891 and employed an art-minded editor named George French who paid special attention in his columns to artistic printing, typography, and graphic design. And here you have him um, at left praising the artist and art director Will Bradley for his integrated approach to design uh, in the Easter 1908 issue of Collier's. And I'm just showing you the cover uh, and back cover there. It's perhaps worth noting that mainstream journals had only recently begun publishing vibrant color illustrations on their covers. J.C. Leyendecker's first cover for the Saturday Evening Post in 1899, for example, is a black and white story style illustration which shares space with the opening paragraphs of the narrative. Just a year or so later, publishers began investing in cover art as a way to sell magazines by essentially packaging them in aesthetically, aesthet aesthetically engaging designs that would outshine the competition from the newsstand. And here I'm just giving you a line decker cover from 1904, which I think makes the shift clear. And here I'm just showing you a cover of a, uh, from about a decade later by Coles Phillips, which appears among others on a New York newsstand in a photograph by Lewis Hine. And my little arrow there is meant to show you where that cover appears in the photograph. I know it's hard to make out. So I think it's clear how the cover is operating as an ad for the magazine product. The vast numbers of illustrated trade journals that emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century appealed to a more specific market than these mainstream magazines, but many of them followed the trend and invested in art as well. 
Some important illustrators designed covers for these journals, and cover concepts could be more whimsical than we might expect of dull business material. All of these, I think, would be equally at home fronting a magazine like the Saturday Evening Post. Highly regarded artists also illustrated interior stories. And here you have uh, one of Will Bradley's illustrated articles in System as an example. Indeed, all of the artists I've named so far, whether they worked primarily for the general or trade publications, also made ads, booklets, company letterhead, posters, basically everything that Hopper made too. Indeed, Hopper arguably had a better understanding of these various printed sales media than some other artists since he spent time working for ad agencies and regularly illustrated articles exploring the mechanisms of trade. And I'm just trying to give you here a wider range of his uh, production. Hopper worked for a stint in the ad agency founded by his art school colleague, Coles Phillips, whose cover art we've already seen. And you have Coles Phillips in the left foreground, Hopper at the right. While working in Phillips' agency, Hopper drew covers for the New York Edison Company's bulletin. And this may have been when he made the profitable advertising design. Or perhaps he made it after he returned from a period in Paris in the fall of 1907 while he was making drawings for the Sherman and Bryan ad agency, and you have two examples of that material at left. If the latter is the case, then the artist would have made the design in the context of the economic panic of 1907, which, as Gail Levin writes, revealed flaws in the currency and credit structure of the American market. In a nutshell, a failed stock manipulation scheme to corner a particular market and the dissolution of banks that held the plummeting stock led to a run on banks and trusts across the country. Bank interests rose and stock prices fell. And while JP Morgan intervened, a crisis of confidence ensued. The panic resulted in drops in industrial production, bankruptcies and a rise in unemployment felt most acutely between May 1907 and June 1908. All of this is to say that if artists in the commercial art trade were emboldened in the early 20th century by a growth of the inter intertwined industries of publishing and advertising, then came a sudden reminder that all of that growth, that opportunity, that profit could vanish in an instant. And I'm just showing you a piece there that signals how the panic made itself felt in the trade press. I can't say for sure that this economic context is relevant to Hopper's unpublished design. But we know that the artist had money on his mind, especially during this period when he was, quote, bound to illustration by economic necessity, end quote, as scholars have told us, knocking on the doors of publishers and ad agencies to sell his work. Given that he illustrated articles like What Makes Men Buy for System and other pieces about how to make the sale, package one's ideas for a mass market, and so on, it's hard for me not to imagine Hopper soaking up the practical lessons of this trade literature, which must have put money on his mind all the more. What did make men buy? Within that essay, which Hopper illustrated, the author explained that, quote, buying motives change constantly, end quote. Thus, figuring out how to appeal to the mysterious and changeable mind of the consumer was something of a conundrum, and I've just underlined that assertion in this piece here. How could publicity, a synonym for advertising at the time, get the goose to lay the golden egg? These are not by Hoffer, which is probably clear to you. If the outcomes of advertising were uncertain in this period, when the industry was just beginning to codify its principles of market research, for example, and psychological influencing, what would make the money flow in? At left, you see a businessman rubbing Aladdin's lamp marked publicity and being rewarded with a cornucopia of coin raining down from above. The first issue of profitable advertising made a spectac spectacle of the cash that would come advertisers' way once the journal showed them how to do it. Agricultural advertising magazines similarly lured readers with the image of hands pouring out coins as if into the hands gripping the magazine. And a company of advertising illustrators sold their art as ideas melted down into a giant dollar sign, if I'm reading the action here correctly, a glowing monument to the capitalist project of transforming all things into figures of economic value. All of these examples portray value as unstable, fluctuating, and unpredictable. 
They clothe economic good fortune in a language of fairy tale, making conversion and metamorphosis the thematic around which the story revolves. The goose eating the seeds of publicity transforms that nourishment into a golden egg. The molten idea is converted into a mighty dollar. The language around American business at this time has all of the forthright purpose and optimism that is associated with the progressive era. Note in the text here that commerce is presented as the nation's contribution to world culture. As the arts were to Greece and warfare to Rome, so is commerce to the United States. And at the left, I'm just showing you the painting that's reproduced here at the right. But there was, of course, worry at the edges of this vision of American commercial progress, which is written all over the trade press to which Hopper contributed. His profitable advertising cover, I think, plays on these tensions. What we have here seems to be an allegorical figuration, a nude, ambiguously gendered, although the sharp jawline reads to my eye as male, with arms up raised, the left hand grabbing a staff-like pole, and drapery winding around the body in an S-curve. The figure's right side forms a vertical line parallel to the pole, creating a stable armature, as it were, for the flexible material held aloft. The arrangement forms, and I'm sure you see where I'm going with this already, a dollar sign <laughs> cloaked in an allegorical guise. You're already there, right? You're already, okay, good. <laughs> The effort to situate the figure under or within the sign of money is perhaps more obvious in Hopper's preliminary study. In the margins, he sketches two dollar sign formations with twin verticals anchoring an almost bulbous S-curve, and I'll just briefly bring back that one I've shown you before to give you a sense for what I'm seeing here. At the center of the sketch, a windswept figure holds what appears to be a bag in one hand, raising the other arm to cast a roughly rectangular object out from the body. Similar forms float up amid cloud-like curves. The sketch in the right margin, with a flurry of short horizontal lines radiating out from the dollar sign, seems to be a way of working out how to represent production and proliferation. So instead of portraying profit as the accumulation of coin, Hopper presents profit as the diffusion and circulation of paper matter issuing from the sign of money which leaves a long trail in the distance and breaks out of the frame in the foreground. This paper matter is all around us, Hopper seems to say, the very atmosphere of commercial culture, like clouds or stars in the sky, part of the very air we breathe. It's hard to say for sure whether Hopper meant this to be a satirical take on the profit motive, motive's function as a sort of guiding star of American culture. But other artists, such as John Sloan, who we know we, he admired, savagely critiqued the visual mechanisms of commerce. In this case, it's reliance on stock figures like the so-called pretty girl, who was used to sell everything from magazines to tires. At right, Sloan imagines the pretty girl staging her own decapitation before the public by taking a delineator cover with just such a figure by another artist and adding a straight razor slicing into her neck. It's one of my favorite things ever in the history of art. So I try to work it into everything. <laughs> Hopper's dollar sign design may similarly critique the visual tropes of sales imagery, specifically the effort to dress up the quest for profit in an artful guise, to give that quest the veneer of cultural sophistication. The utility of art to advertising was hotly debated when Hopper entered the field. Some felt it was distracting, made the consumer mind wander too far away from the buying action the ad was supposed to initiate. One of the champions of beauty as tool for business was the ad agency owner, Ernest Elmo Calkins. And I'm just showing you one of his important texts for a general educated audience from the late 20s, which built on earlier explorations of the subject. Within a couple of decades, and certainly by the time Hopper made these covers, the late, in the late teens and 20s, art had proven its value to a wide range of industries, including hospitality. This was in part because quality art sold the progress and sophistication of American commerce and culture more broadly. 
Those in the commercial art trade repeatedly stressed that this was where to find the country's most advanced artistic contributions. Art for business was not just art, they said, it was art plus. But would art plus endure? If profits could blow away on the wind, what was the value of the ephemeral art that was attached to this or that product? Was commercial art just another species of paperwork that would be tossed out if not filed away in a drawer? And I'm just trying to show you here, uh, give you a sense for the trade press's preoccupation with paperwork, both in terms of production and organization. Roll top desks were, rep were replaced with fat, flat desks that allowed for the sort of spreading out that you see at the top left. And paperwork experts sought to devise better methods of organizing records and correspondence into workable systems. At right, you have a comment on the diversification of advertising campaigns, which produced ever more paper matter like leaflets referred to in the caption. Did they have any practical value or did they simply, quote, block up the letterbox, end quote. I can't help but wonder if Hopper asked himself these questions and if works like his profitable advertising design were a way of questioning the value of his paper contributions to commercial culture. It's not hard to find evidence of Hopper's distaste for that culture, as I suggested at the start. While abroad in 1907, he explained his preference for Paris by describing London as deserving of its bad name, not only because of its weather, but because it was, quote, like New York, essentially a commercial city, end quote. Much later, when he painted a store, storefront window display, he seemed to poke fun at the commercial emblems of urban America by featuring a product that promised to alleviate an embarrassing and private condition, constipation. When he submitted this painting for exhibition at the Rain Galleries for his third solo show in 1929, Frank Wren's wife suggested that he alter the sign to avoid putting off potential buyers. He replaced X lax with X lack, L-A-C, but changed the sign back when the collector John Taylor Spaulding purchased the painting a few months later. <laughs> now, plenty of artists devoted major canvases to commercial signage, window dressing, product packaging, and ad matter in the teens and 20s, some of which you can see in the exhibition, uh, such as the Demuth. And I should just point out that the Stieglitz uh, photograph features commercial signage in the illuminated rectangle at the right, but Stieglitz is going to make that difficult for you to perceive, of course. But Hopper the dyspeptic had a wry sense of humor, which makes me think that the choice to feature this particular product was his way of critiquing the techniques of commercial art particularly the effort to ennoble and beautify a product like x lax <laughs> via aesthetically pleasing imagery. And what you see here is like the company's instructions for dealers to set up a beautiful 12-piece color window display. <laughs> what should we make of Hopper's own beautification via dramatic lighting, rich saturated color, and so on? of sites of business and exchange, such as hotel lobbies and office spaces. Are these subjects, too, part of an extended exploration on Hopper's part of the value of the American commercial atmosphere? Some of these drawings are devoted to office spaces resembling Hopper's trade journal drawings with men at desks gripping paper in their hands, and in the case of office at night, a secretary, secretary poised at a filing cabinet from where the sheet has come or may finally be placed once its content is assessed. Turning to the office after dark was one surefire way to inject mystery into the quotidian framework of office culture, and Hopper would go this route again in conference at night with long shadows giving a noir, very 40s feel to the animated conversation taking place amid desks or tables eerily cleared of the day's paper chaos. But this is not a wholesale overturning of the paper precedents. In his illustrations, as in the paintings, Hopper often organized his office scenes by giving ample space to bright, undecorated wall, as you see here. And already in the illustrations, ambiguity characterizes social exchange within such spaces. Exchange is vague enough to allow for repurposing in very different kinds of stories. 
So despite commercial illustration's reputation for narrative clarity, stock imagery like this had to be flexible and open-ended in order to migrate in this way. The open-endedness of the stock image took on a different, more mysterious air once translated to large-scale painting. But the basic structure, I think, remains the same. Situations vague in content, set in environments evacuated of distracting details, often set the scene for more formal investigations, not only in the paintings, but in the illustrations as well. People gathered around desks served, served as occasions for exploring the rectilinear patterns made by light and shade, which Hopper often underscores by having these atmospheric block formations intersect with similarly structured windows and doors, picture frames and furniture. And I think this is quite evident in the um, detail at the right as the light bends around from the wall to the door. This is a signature trope of the mature paintings, the block of light beaming into interiors from open doorways and windows. There are ephemeral patterns that are only temporary, but make a strong visual impression. Circulating across hotel rooms, offices, and other sorts of spaces Hopper featured, these hard-edged light formations seem to weirdly solidify the rectilinear forms that go flying off in all directions in his profitable advertising cover. It's as if all of the paper being pushed across desks, filed, folded on one's commute, and sent through the mail far and wide in Hopper's illustrations found a home in the paintings as a different species of ephemerality, a different envisioning of art in the air. If these weighty blocks of light can be said to circulate across these spaces, they do so slowly and deliberately at the right pace for Hopper, the painfully slow painter who sometimes made just two oils a year. If I'm on the right track in this interpretive angle, then this is Hopper not turning his back on the paperworks of his early career, but rather reforming them, or the sign of them, into something more substantial. The artist's paperwork for the commercial press was not just preliminary to the business of great painting then, but structurally foundational to it and integral to the Hopper brand. Thank you. <laughs>